When I was first asked to give this talk, I was absolutely terrified uh, what it means to be a female director. No pressure, right? Um, I, was, I knew it was that it was a topical thing that was going on. Also, it was an interesting conversation to have. Um, and it's a subject that's very close to my heart, seeing how, if you haven't noticed, <laughs> I happen to be female. Um, now, when I was 10, um, the, old, the same age as my oldest daughter is now. I have two girls, uh, 10 and 4. And I was told when I was 10 that I couldn't be a director because it was for 40 and 50 year old men. Uh, when I was 16, I enrolled in an improv class because I wanted to be a director and I wanted to learn more about the process that actors go through. So I kind of wanted to embed myself. Um, I did that class and at the end, my teacher told me that I should go into acting because I might see some money in it versus directing where I'll see no money in it. Um, when I was 17, I was the vice president of the drama club in high school, and uh, my drama teacher told me that I would never succeed in filmmaking. Uh, when I was 18, I got ready to move to LA. I grew up in Michigan. I was ready to just get the hell out of Dodge. Um, and my extended family said, oh, you'll be back. You'll be back to the Midwest. I am, so they're not wrong. <laughs> um, when I was 19, and my college professor, I went to UCLA until I couldn't afford it, um, not even on ramen noodles <laughs> could I afford to have electricity and be able to live in LA and have one job and be able to keep school. Um, but my college professor told me that um, I wouldn't succeed in the Hollywood system because I was female. So I quit school. Um, when I was 25, my first daughter was born. And my dad was there and he was holding her up and he was snuggling with her and he's like, I wonder what she will become. And I said, she will become whatever she chooses in this world. And it was an eye-opening experience for me um, because of all those naysayers that kind of put caution tape around my dream, they do that with everybody. We've all had somebody say, oh, why would you want to? Or, oh, that's going to be too hard. Or what you really should do is such and such. So I knew that to be able to fully encourage my children, I had to practice what I preached. So I didn't want them to come to me and say, you know, I, I want to be a magician. And I never tried at filmmaking, so I'd be like, no, you're not David Copperfield, you never succeed, you know, we don't live in Vegas, you'll never be a great magician. So I decided, no, if I actually go and fight for my dream and what I want to do and what fills my life with passion, when they turn to me and say there's anything that they want to be, because I have lived that, I'll be saying, hey, let's figure it out. Let's figure out the best path to success for you. Uh, let's try it. Let's experiment with it. Maybe you'll like it. Maybe you won't. Maybe you'll do absolutely brilliant at it. And maybe you won't. But let's try it. If that's what fills your heart with joy, let's try it. Um, so my children are my motivating force, honestly, to make films. Um, it was, I was 29 when I made my first For Reels film, yo. Uh, that actually showed to an audience. Um, and at that point, I just felt free. I felt like this is what I was hiding from. This is what they were saying I couldn't do. And as soon as I showed it to an audience, the world didn't end. <laughs> Nobody came and tried to arrest me and put me to dream jail that, you know, that I actually was trying to do what I wanted to do. Um, so it was absolutely amazing. Um, the, I've had a lot of naysayers. I think we all have. But the naysayers haven't stopped. Um, I've been called a bitch. I've been called uh, crazy, unstable. My favorite is a nursemaid to a bunch of nuts. I don't know why I love that one so much. Um, not on my own productions, but working on other people's productions in freelance. Um, if I'm stressing, hey, we're running late, or you know, this particular setup is going to take too long and I'm in charge of scheduling, um, I have had somebody say to me, what are you on the rag or something? Um, these are a lot of things that, uh, that I have had to face, that I have had to kind of suck it up and deal. Um, I do get a lot of who does she think she is, um, especially on Facebook and Twitter. Those are my favorites. When it's, oh, Kate, who does she think she is this time? Um, but I've also, on the other hand, had emails and phone calls and people stopping me saying that I'm an inspiration to dreamers not just filmmakers, but any dream, anybody who's fighting for something, their little piece of happiness. Um, I've been called a motivating force, a door opener. My dad called me a rainmaker the other day. 
I, I, I'm just saying, I made it rain in Bloomington, apparently, every time I come here. <laughs> um, I've been called an infectious spirit, but honestly, I just think of myself as a filmmaker. Um, I love movies. Movies are my greatest teachers. Movies are what reinforce the lessons that my parents and my friends and people around me taught. Um, I've always had a connection to movies and how they can inspire people. Um, I know that I have had to push myself harder um, than most because I know that the odds are severely against me. Um, I know I'm going to damn well try. <laughs> uh, blood, sweat, and tears, and whether I win, lose, or draw, I know that I have tried my best. Um, my goal is to keep making movies, to be knowledgeable, to be creative, to be compassionate, um, to have no regrets, and just keep making movies. Um, in the last seven years, since I started my production company, Karmic Courage Productions, um, I've made 14 films. Uh, we've made films with budgets for $23, and we've made films for budgets of eight grand. So we've kind of done every little spectrum. We've done music videos and commercials, uh, shorts, and last summer, well, no, this, yeah, last summer, uh, made my first feature film called Ingenue. Um, and that is a passion project for me. I didn't know if I would get to features. I wanted to mess up in shorts as much as I possibly could until I got onto the feature. Um, I've won awards in Indiana and LA. Um, I've freelanced on over 30 projects um, throughout the state. Um, I don't think I've gone out of state. I think I've always stayed within the state working on other people's films. Um, I work on other people's films as either an assistant director or a script supervisor or a production assistant. Um, I take every film as a learning process, and with each one, I get a little bit better. So um, let's talk specifically now about directing, because um, I want to make sure I get into that. Now, I want to stress there is no difference between a male director and a female director. There is no difference. It is extremely gut-wrenchingly hard, and it'll crack the strongest person. It really will. You have a lot of creative minds that are around you, and you hired them for a reason, to be creative around you. Um, so you need to be able to work with that, and sometimes it works well, and sometimes it doesn't. It's a mix of personalities. We, uh, when I think of directing, um, the, the best way that I can kind of sum it up is a boat, is a ship. And the director is the ship's captain. They may not set the sails, they may not swab the decks, but they know that there is land ho, and if the crew believes in them, they will get to that land. Um, so the director does get a lot more credit at certain times. Um, people will go see a film, a new film by Scorsese or Nolan or Spielberg, um, and because they have a good directing status or they have a brand that we're familiar with. Um, but because it's a huge collaboration of people that get together and no one person actually makes a movie, sometimes you get something awesome and you get Goodfellas. Sometimes you get War of the Worlds. I'm talking the Tom Cruise version. <laughs> so the more that you can listen to your team and create a collaboration and encourage ideas, um, the better. What you need to do as a director is kind of filter that through of what is best for the audience. What is the story you're telling? What are the themes? What is the message you're trying to get through? So if you take all those creative ideas and kind of funnel them through. Um, I'll give you an example. Uh, Francis Ford Coppola made uh, the movie The Conversation. And to him, he picked the project because it was a movie that spoke about privacy. That was what he created as his theme. So when a costume designer brought him three raincoats for an extra, or just you know like a featured extra kind of running through, he picked the one that was see-through because it said something about privacy. So having a theme, having a message that you can get through to your team makes everything so much easier. Everybody's on the same path. Um, now, I'm also going to use the word successful a couple of times. <laughs> and I want you to know that when I say successful, um, I don't mean fame and fortune and glory and all that kind of good stuff. Um, success can be whatever you determine it. It can be um, you know, a profitable film, critical acclaim, a great distribution deal, an award, etc. cetera. Um, for me, success means I get to make another movie. That's my version of success. Um, now, and others will try to qualify it for you too. Uh, they'll determine your success as, oh, well, it only made so much money, or it only got shown here, or your mom only saw it, you know, um, where your success could be, hey, I finished the movie, you know what I mean? So don't let anybody take away your 
value of success. Um, now, also, also with directing, directing, you want to make sure that you're not bringing emotional baggage to a film set when you're directing. Um, I think of emotional baggage as basically the anchor on that great ship that you're trying to get everybody to the harbor and you're just dragging it along. Um, the emotional baggage that I'm talking about that I, I see with male and female uh, filmmakers is um, this person is questioning me because they have authority issues. You know, they're not actually listening to the ideas, they're just going straight into defense. Um, or they're asking me so many questions because they don't think I know what I'm doing. Uh, this kind of mindset really slows the process down. Um, and there is no getting around it. Your creative people, that your team that you hire behind you, they have big personalities. Uh, they run on a wide range of emotions. If they didn't, they would be engineers and in the medical field. Um, you're hiring them for your, their passion and their creativity. Um, one thing they're always thinking about, whether it's a makeup design or it's a set design, what emotionally does this say to an audience? So they're thinking about that. So when they come to you and they sometimes have heated debates and stubbornness and damn it, I'm gonna do it my way, it comes from passion. So being able to be, you know, have a little bit of psychology, a little bit of linguistics, um, a little bit like almost a circus wrangler, I would say, to kind of bring that in, to not take things personally, that they're just really excited about this special effect that didn't work, and they're mad and they need to vent it out. Um, it's not always, you know, an attack on a director and that sort of thing. Um, so now we are here to talk about female directors um, and the obstacles we face because we have boobs. Just saying. All right, so I'm, I really don't want to make this talk at all, and you guys all seem awesome. <laughs> I really don't want to make this talk sexist or misogynistic because it's fire, you know, fire with fire. There is really no point. Uh, no group is better than the other. We're just different. Just sometimes the things that we approach are different. Um, now, I did take heat <laughs> publicly and privately for even thinking about coming and doing this talk. Um, I did get the wonderful who do you think you are and all that kind of good stuff. So I do thank you for coming out. For some reason, I have a giant bullseye on me for some reason. Um, now, I will say also, I don't think of myself as a feminist. Um, all I know is that I have two children and that I have two girls. And when I see things that are happening, I want them to be able to fulfill their health and happiness. And so when I see something that seems to be a warning sign that might take away their health or happiness, it's a trigger for me. So I get very passionate about this issue, more because I'm a mom than anything else. So I'm not gonna go way back into the history. You guys, a lot of you guys film majors. <laughs> so you know that the movie camera was invented in 1888. However, um, the first commercial use was actually to use it as a peep show camera. Um, it wasn't until 1895 in France where films started developing into stories and what we now know. Um, the Lumiere brothers, George Millier, Charles Path, and the Goumont Film Company, they were all at the forefront of telling stories. At the Goumont Film Company was Alice Guy Blanche. Alice Guy Blanche was actually the head of that film company, and she was there from 1896 to 1920. Uh, she was actually the first person, not the first female, the first person ever to make a narrative film. Before then, it was just kind of, you know, missed a scene where it was just things putting together, trains going by, and that sort of thing. She actually directed over 700 films. Um, now, she opened the door for Louise, Le uh, Louise Weber, and she is actually considered the most successful female director of all time. Um, she made 200 to 400 films. She made a lot more features than she made shorts. That's why her number is less than 700. Um, only about 20 films of hers have survived. Um, I actually have never been able to see a Louise Webster movie, so that's really odd. Um, she was the first person to use split string technology. She was the first to experiment with sound. And again, I'm not saying first woman, I'm saying the first person ever. She was the first female to make a feature film, though, and she was the first female ever to own her own studio. Um, she did, however, in her career, advise young women to avoid a filmmaking career. Uh, she became untrusted because she wanted a lot of control, as much control as she could get. Um, and unfortunately, uh, she died penniless at the age of 50. So, sad Lois Webster. Oh, no, no, you went too far. Go back. I can't do like Jack and Titanic. Go back, go back, go back. Let's see. 
if I get too much, okay. So Lou, uh, Lois Webster opened the door for Dorothy Arsnier. Um, Dorothy Arsnier did films from 1929 to 1943, and she actually kind of was, really? She was brought into, through um, uh, William DeMille, which was actually Cecil B. DeMille's brother, um, and she started at the Paramount Studios. Um, she was the first female ever to join the DGA, and she actually was the person who invented the boom mic. Um, she did, she introduced us to Clara Bow. She made Clara Bow's first film. Without her, we wouldn't know about Katherine Hepburn, Rosalind Russell, and Lucille Ball. She took a chance on them and decided to feature them in her movies, and we all kind of know that they took off a little bit. So female filmmakers were just as commercially successful as male filmmakers at the turn of the century. Um, there was a decline in the 20s, again in the 40s, and then a serious decline in the 70s. Um, women were courageous problem solvers. They weren't the ones that were looking to adapt to the resources in this new broadening filmmaking. They were the ones that were actually inventing new technology of how it could move forward. Um, actually, Lewis Webster was one that was looking forward to 3D. She wanted to do some kind of third dimension filmmaking, and this was in 1916. So they were very eager to move this process forward and engage more people. Um, and of course, without their innovations, we probably wouldn't know film as we do today. What I do find it odd is that when we're talking about these female directors at the turn of the century, 100 years ago, um, women couldn't even vote, yet they were making just as many movies as men, and they were just as successful. Um, so now, let's get into glorious numbers of today and age. Today, only 5% of filmmakers are women in the top 250 grossing movies of all time, or grossing movies of 2011, sorry. So that actually equals only 12 films. So 12 films out of 250 were directed by women last year. Um, we, as far as the industry as a whole, um, we've got, <laughs> is it just me or does it look like Pac-Man? It was not my intention, <laughs> but it looks like Pac-Man. But we've got 5% of women are directors, we've got 18% are executive producers, 14% of women are writers, 20% are editors, only 4% are in cinematography, so I think that is actually another discussion that I think is kind of not being brought up as it should be. And 25% uh, of females are producers. So we, we take up a little tiny chunk <laughs> of the 250, um, and so, it's, I mean, does this seem fair to anybody? <laughs> that all, women only make up 18% of the top jobs, basically the department head jobs of the film industry in those fil in the 250 films. Um, I'll tell you why it's actually a bigger issue. Um, I'm, I'm always kind of like a top-down thinker, you know what I mean? It's like, okay, well that's what's going on in the film industry. What's actually going on globally? Um, this uh, just came out in June. This is the Global Gender Gap Report, and this actually measures um, economic participation and opportunity, educational attainment, health and survival, and political empowerment. The United States of America is number 22 on this chart. We are 22. <laughs> um, countries that are beating us are Cuba, Belgium, the Philippines, and Austria. Um, the main, where we fall, where we get low on this chart is actually um, political empowerment and health and survival. So, uh, so let's get back to America a second. Let's get back to um, uh, when it comes to the film market here in the States. Of 16% of the films that are released, oh, sorry, of the films that are released, only 16% are actually targeted towards women. Women make up 51% of the population. Uh, women are the main deciders on what the ticket sales are. You know, hey, honey, you want to go out on a date? What do you want to see? Um, you know, let's get the kids out for the weekend. What should we go see? Um, it's been surveyed that women are the majority of the deciders, you know, or they'll be like, yeah, sure, that sounds fine, honey. Either way. <laughs> That's what I tend to do. Prometheus again? Yeah, that sounds great, honey. Yeah, we'll do that. Um, women are also 60% of the media push. So, you know, when something's being shared or when something's being tweeted or um, when something is going viral, 60% of women are generally the ones that are clicking that on and making those posts. So, ticket buyers, we've got basically close to half and half, right? So, half and half, 
We're pretty even. Yeah, women are making the decisions on maybe what movies to be sometimes. Um, and they're also helping push out movies. But only 16% of the movie are actually targeted towards women. Meryl Streep has actually got into this debate, which I think is hysterical because she won't direct. Did anybody see that uh, 60 Minutes interview where they asked her if she would direct? She's like, I don't want that kind of commitment. That's like way too much. That's like a full two years of work. I get to just come in, do my part, get my pretty makeup on, and get to do a movie. So she's like really freaking smart, but unfortunately I wish she would direct. Um, but Meryl Streep is quoted with saying, um, <clears throat> five little movies aimed at women have earned $1.6 billion. The Help, Iron Lady, Bridesmaids, Mamma Mia, and The Devil Wears Prada. The Iron Lady cost $14 million to make and it brought in $114 million. And that is pure profit, so why? Why don't they want the money? Nobody's really answering Meryl Streep. <laughs> but it would make sense in a money-based business. The film industry is money-based. Um, so let me tell you a little story about Bridesmaids. So Bridesmaids, anybody see Bridesmaids? OK, good. All right, have and have. Um, so Bridesmaids actually had several directors that were considered for the movie. Um, they only considered one female director, the director who did 27 Dresses and The Proposal. Makes sense. They decided not to go with her, though. Um, and so they hired Paul Figg. Paul Figg is the director of Bridesmaids. And he made um, Knocked Up. Um, and he did a lot of kind of edgy TV shows and stuff like that. So he was a very, very good fit. Um, the film was actually targeted towards men. It actually says on the poster, uh, from Knocked Up and the 40-Year-Old Virgin. So that was the audience they were going for. Um, and uh, they were marketing it on Spike TV. Um, during football games and all that kind of good stuff to get it out there. Well, what happened was opening weekend, it did okay. <clears throat> and then women started taking their girlfriends and they started taking their moms and they started taking their aunts. Next thing you know, the next box office weekend, it actually got bigger. And they realized, holy crap, women are actually going to see this. And they started changing their campaign. Their advertising campaign started becoming more for women. And the film went on to gross $169 million. So this is just a case in point of women don't just go see Twilight. They also go see Bridesmaids. <laughs> the Twilight lines are incredible. The, the research on how many, how many women bought tickets for Twilight, it's kind of scary and a little depressing, actually. <laughs> so um, does anybody want to guess on what the highest grossing movie ever directed by a woman is? It's not Twilight, which I just mentioned. Mamma Mia? Mamma Mia is on the list, it's not the not top one. Worldwide, anybody? Kung Fu Panda 2. <laughs> Kung Fu Panda 2. Anybody know that was directed by a woman? I had no idea, I was doing this and I'm like, what? Um, Jennifer Yeo, she has only directed Kung Fu Panda 1, Kung Fu Panda 2, and is slated to do Kung Fu Panda 3. Um, but it is the highest grossing movie ever directed by a woman. It brought in $637 million worldwide. Um, I don't think it's important, but $91 million of that was China, by the way. <laughs> um, so China is now becoming a serious draw when it comes to uh, films that are coming out of, what will China think? Because if they like it, they'll give us lots of money. Um, our glorious runners up are Mamma Mia. Mamma Mia is the second highest gross, uh, $609 million in 2008. Um, then when we're talking domestically, when we're talking here in the US, Elvin and the Chipmunks, anybody know that was directed by a woman? Because I had no idea. Um, that one's the highest domestic gross, uh, followed by Twilight, which grossed $192 million here in the US. So those are our top films directed by women. Yay! <laughs> so, Obviously, we are showing that female-centered films, females or films that are marketed towards women, can make boatloads of money. Um, we also noticed something with these films. I mean, as we kind of surveyed loosely the room, that we had no idea that they were directed by women. So that advertising, um, that's not a selling point, apparently, to mention that it's directed by a woman. I, I really, I had no idea Alvin and the Chipmunks and Kung Fu Panda were directed by, and I look for it. <laughs> I'm actually actively looking to be like, hey, that's a chica, I gotta go check that out and support that. So we know that females can make great films, Twilight, as I, I stare at Twilight as I say that too, I'm telling you. 
So let's talk about the path for a female director. As you will notice in this gloriously chart, all paths lead to indie filmmaking. Every single one of them will lead to indie filmmaking. Um, the way to really kind of get into indie filmmaking is screenwriting. Um, Nora Ephron was a screenwriter first before she became a director. Art director, Catherine Hardwick was uh, an art director before she became an indie filmmaker. Um, camera department, I really wish I had an example. Does anybody know um, of a female filmmaker that started in the camera department and then started directing? Very awesome, okay. Gotcha. And then she's perfect. I saw that it happens. <laughs> um, obviously actress, um, Jodie Foster was, you know, a very popular one. I'm even gonna put Penny Marshall in there. Um, started as an actress first. Um, and then marry a producer, I think, helps a lot of things, actually. Um, there wasn't many female directors in the 70s, but the ones they were, they were married to a producer. So, you know, it, uh, it seems to help the cause. Um, but all paths now lead to glorious indie filmmaking. So let's talk about the cycle. And I didn't mean this to be a pun, women, I'm sorry. Cycle, I, it's terrible, I know. Um, of an indie filmmaker, all right? So you start with developing a project. Then you're gonna spend most of your time raising money for that project, because you're indie, right? A studio is not writing you a check and says, go have fun, make me a movie. Um, you're beg borrowing and stealing and talking to as many people with thick wallets as you can to invest in your movie. Then you get a little bit of time to make the movie. Um, then the rest of the time, you're basically selling and promoting the film. Um, this cycle takes about two to four years, depending on the movie. So. Then you're hoping there's profit so you can start the cycle over again and develop a project and raise money and make another movie and all that kind of good stuff. So it takes a while um, for an indie filmmaker. Um, we can't be as, um, you know, we can't be making as many projects back to back to back because we have this cycle that we actually need to go through. Really? No? Okay, next. There you go. No! No! Why did you not like me, PowerPoint? You're so mean. Okay, so now I'm gonna give you an example of this turnaround process of why we're not seeing as many films from female filmmakers um, because of this cycle that it takes. So I, I, this is as fair as I could do to kind of compare, and I still don't think it's the fairest. So um, I'm, I wanna compare Amy Heckerling to Tim Burton, okay? I picked these two because they started around the same time. Amy started in 82. Um, <clears throat> with Fast Times at Ridgemont High, which was a studio film. And Tim Burton started in 1985, he was working for Disney. Um, and he started with Pee-wee's Big Adventure, which was a studio film. Um, both of them <coughs> are artsy, you know what I mean? They have a brand, they have a niche. Amy Heckerling um, has really kind of outrageous comedies. I'm talking Johnny Dangerously, if there's any Johnny Dangerously fans in here. Oh, I'm disappointed, I love Johnny Dangerously. Okay. Once. Thank you. Love me some Johnny Dangerously. Okay, so all right, so we'll compare Amy Heckerling to Tim Burton, all right? Um, you'll notice that Amy Heckerling has made nine movies from 1982 to today, where Tim Burton has made 16 movies. You can actually see Frankenweenie and, and Dark Shadows came out the same year. Also, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory and Corpse Bride came out the same year. That is a way to develop your brand. Um, think of it as, you know, uh, the new hit artist that's coming out. Notice how they have an album really soon after their first album. Um, some actually go into an artist, you know, sophomore slump and all that kind of good stuff. But it's creating a brand. Ooh, you like this? Here's something new. You like that? Okay, I'm going to do it again and again and again. Um, the problem is, if you look at Amy Heckerling, she's going four, five, seven years between projects. It's very hard to keep your brand out there, to keep your name out there. Um, and Amy Heckerling was doing studio projects until she started around uh, Loser. Loser in 2000 is when she started going independent. Um, so now let's compare Catherine Bigelow and Christopher Nolan. The reason why I have these two compared is these are big budget, tent pole, popcorn selling movies, okay? Catherine Bigelow does a lot of big movies. The thing with Catherine Bigelow that I found out doing this research and I was just mind blown. She has never been funded by a studio. She has always independently gone and got money and the studio says, 
Well, if you make it, and you make it good, and the price is right, well, we'll distribute it. Okay, but she has to do all the hard work on her own. And we're talking, this is 1982, okay? And she's making these big movies. So we've got Catherine Bigelow who's making big movies, and we've got Christopher Nolan who's making big movies. Catherine Bigelow started in 1982. Christopher Nolan started in 1998. Christopher Nolan has made, I'm looking for eight movies, as has Catherine Bigelow. They both made the same amount of movies in that time. <clears throat> so again, look at the year between it. Um, Catherine Bigelow is making a film every, well, we've got six years, and then we've got two years, we've got five, we've got four. You know what I mean? There's, there's a distance there. We've got Christopher Nolan's making a movie every two years. Um, the following was an independent film that he made. The rest of them have been studio. And he has been consistently making a movie every two years. His movies aren't, like, fast and cheap to make either. Um, what was it? The Dark Knight Rises, they filmed for 90 days? 60 or 90 days? Um, and it's still just a churning machine to build that brand name. So it's very hard to compete. Um, now, I also want to talk about oh, crap. <laughs> um, the difference between studio and independent. When we talk about studio, we're talking about the big six. Um, the big six hardly ever change. Um, but those big six own other little tiny companies which people, they say, oh, no, 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 no. That Miramax is totally independent. Dude, Disney's owned that for a while now. <laughs> so they come off as independent friendly, um, and, and that's why they have so many different deviations from the big six. So, yeah, Paramount owns, I know some of these logos are hard to see, so I'll tell you. Paramount owns Nickelodeon, which also owns MTV Films. Warner Brothers owns New Line, HBO, Castle Rock, and the DC film line. Um, Sony Pictures is Columbia TriStar, and they own Destination Films. Uh, Disney has Pixar, Touchstone Pictures, Marvel, the, again, the, the film licensing, and Miramax. Um, Universal, which is owned by Comcast and NBC, which is, I always think, a very dangerous player because, oh, do they get a deal on their advertising compared to everybody else? <laughs> uh, they also own Focus Features and Destination, no, Working Title. Working Title used to be independent. I love Working Title. Um, 20th Century Fox owns Blue Sky, which on top of uh, making your Ice Age movies also makes your Angry Birds game, um, and Regency. So when we're talking about a big six, these are companies that look for material, green light material, do a whole bunch of research. Um, uh, I should say that lightly, the research. Um, it's a numbers thing. <laughs> There's actually a point system for a movie they decide to make. Um, if it's an action movie, it gets so many points. If it's a drama, it gets a lot less points, but it gets points. If it's got a certain star, there are actually stars that have a certain number weight system. Um, a Clint Eastwood will get you more points than, a, I have no idea. Um, anybody. <laughs> what? Nick Nolte. Nick Nolte. Oh, good one. <laughs> so based on that number system of your genre and your budget and your, or, and your director and all that kind of, and your writer, um, it's whether or not your movie will get greenlit, which is very sad. It has nothing to do with the quality of the material and all that kind of good stuff. So these, for female directors, uh, like for example, me, I will never, <laughs> never probably have any of these companies write me a check to make me a movie. Um, most female filmmakers, and when I'm talking about most, I'm saying of that 5% of those 12 movies that were uh, made the 250 list, um, we're talking very, maybe like half a percent were actually anything studio related. So now you are in the independent film market, um, you're making your own film, you're getting your funding for your own film, which you're in great company. I mean, Catherine Bigelow is doing it. Um, most, actually 75% of films nowadays, of all films, 75% are independently financed. Um, so when you have your film and you're looking at selling your film, there's a lot of places you can go, but these are the two places that I'm going to recommend because it, they actually have a proven track record. Um, the Sundance Film Festival, there was actually 24 films bought last year. Um, when I started um, in the 90s, there was close to 200 films that were being bought at Sundance every year and they were paying upwards of 10, 20 million for them. Um, things have rapidly changed. The most they paid for any movie at Sundance was $6 million, and that was the surrogate. Um, most that they paid for was only $1 million. 
So here's what I'm going to recommend to you. <laughs> Be an independent filmmaker, create your own brand, but never make a movie over $1 million. Because if you are in the opportunity to actually sell your film, and you make it for less than $1 million, you get to take the rest of that and go make another movie and keep going and keep going. Um, another one is the American film market. The American film market, they show 400 films, finished films, um, and 8,000 industries attend in Santa Monica every year. Now, I've had friends that have gone, and they say it's more about promises than sales. <laughs> so keep that in mind. There's a lot of people who are looking to buy material, but they're like, you know, we'll talk about it, we'll see what else. It's almost like it's a big fancy party for them. So, so those are the two areas where you can actually go and get your films done. Um, I will also tell you in the research that I found that 95% um, of, um, of female directors never have a budget over $10 million. And it's actually really sad because really? <laughs> Every time? <laughs> um, <clears throat> So you have your film that you've made definitely under $10 million, probably for only a million dollars, um, independently sent out there, hopefully by a name distributor in the independent world, and you need to compete with films that have a $30 million budget to a $300 million budget. Unfair? Yes. <laughs> then again, so is filmmaking. Um, I will point out that I just I grabbed a random week I will notice that the only independent film, Lionsgate is actually independent still, still. I'm sure that will be bought up by somebody soon. Um, Mendia's Witness Program. That is the only independent projects on there. Everybody else is a conglomerate of the big six. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, okay. So now, how can we level the playing field? Um, hey, it did it once, yes. Okay, so these are suggestions that have come out from the big players. Um, to say, how can this change? How can we level the playing field? We don't have that many female filmmakers that are out there. It takes them two to four years to actually put another project out there to show that women are still out there. So how can we fix it? Um, <clears throat> Susan Cartsanas. Susan Cartsanas ran Fox for 10 years. Um, she says that there needs to be more female-owned production companies. Um, uh, they are on the rise. We are getting a lot more female uh, producers, they are creating material that is designed for women, targeted towards women, etc. But we are still in a decline of female directors as we increase the number of production companies that are female owned. Uh, it's also been said that, well, female films just don't make money. We proved that totally wrong. <laughs> um, you know, with Iron Lady, who's made a hundred million dollars profit, profit, and Phyllis Lloyd still does not have a studio deal. That makes no sense to me as a business person of, wow, she made tons of money. She knows exactly how to put costs where they are, get it to an audience and make money. I would give her a studio deal, but she still doesn't have one. In fact, right now on IMDb, she doesn't have a next project that she's working on. Um, we've also heard, well, you know, if more women won awards. Well, we probably remember Catherine Bigelow's big win. She was the first ever female filmmaker to win. Um, an Oscar, only four females have ever been nominated for that since the, what is it, 85, 84 years of the Academy Awards. Um, but still, since 2010, we've actually gone from 7% of female directors to 5% today. So that didn't help. Um, <clears throat> the Kevin Smith clerks approach, is anybody familiar with what I'm kind of thinking of? It used to be in 1994, and I, I still think a lot of independent filmmakers have this idea that you gotta do the Kevin Smith approach. Kevin Smith approach is you make a film on a credit cards, <laughs> as many credit cards as you possibly have, um, and you take your film to Sundance. And then at Sundance, they're going to buy and distribute and you know, give you wine and roses and all that kind of good stuff, and then they're gonna give you a big budget to make the next one and the next one and the next one. Well, unfortunately, the film industry has changed way too much since 1994. Um, that is not a reliable way to go about to keep making movies to level the playing field for any director, regardless, um, male or female. Um, so the real solutions that, uh, that I'm going to recommend, and this is just from you know, playing this game, researching this game, and trying to find a back door, basically. Um, I think, and I'll talk more about this in a second, but not to sexualize women, but to empower them. The reason why is because you will start tapping 
that 60% of Twitter and Facebook. Um, you will start to get that 51% of ticket buyers. Women will start to be like, hey, you know what? This film didn't insult me. It empowered me. I want to go tell everybody that I know to go see this movie. And trust me, that helps. Um, embrace being independent. Just embrace it. Don't think that it's, you know, oh, I got to stay independent. I really want that Warner Brothers deal. Just embrace being independent. It's going to be the way that it's going to be, and you can make it work for you. Independent means you have control. So never think that you don't have control of your project. Create a brand. Um, brand is something that you or your company or your films are known for. You think of Tim Burton, you think of a brand. He's got quirky, artsy, you know what I mean? Johnny Depp's in it. <laughs> it's, it's a brand. It's something that people um, are, yeah, you know what? I saw the last one, I wanna go see this one. Um, just on blind faith, knowing nothing about it, they will go see it because you've created a brand. Find your audience. Figure out who your target market is for the independent film you do and get them. Um, I've been very lucky with geeks, and I say that because I am one. Um, Sci-fi conventions, uh, writing conventions, um, those audiences, they dig what I do and I get to talk to them. And I get to talk to them and we get to geek out and we get to quote movies and it's awesome. Uh, that is my audience that I have found, is my geeky people who love to go to conventions and dress up all awesome. Um, become a visionary. It's the same story. Every story is either man against man, man against nature, or man against himself. Pretty much every story has been told. But create a new way of telling that story. Become a visionary. Don't go into trends. Don't, you know, oh, well, vampires are popular right now. You know what I mean? Be a visionary. If you're going to do a vampire one, really, really invent the crap out of it. And then make another film. Um, I always love this math. Luck means strength over time. So, you know, oh, they got lucky. You know what, they were probably in the game for a long time when they got lucky. <laughs> so the longer that you're playing this game, the longer that you get to know people, the more that you network, find your audience, and create a brand, the more successful you'll be. Now, instead of the Kevin Smith approach, here's the approach that I actually recommend. And I take a lot of crap for, for loving Tyler Perry, but I do love Tyler Perry. Tyler Perry has directed 24 films since 2002. That is incredible. Okay? Like him, hate him, doesn't matter. That man's making movies. That man has a studio in Atlanta and he is cranking out movies every single year. And you know what? He's making enough money to make another movie and to make another movie. And he gives back to the community and he offers people a chance to work in film and to be independent and to be empowered. <laughs> um, one thing that he did so he did not rely on the studio system. He, did not, he knew that was not going to be an option for him. What he did is he was very active in his church. So he realized, well, my audience, my target market, is these people here at church. So what he decided to do was to make his movie. And he would go and he would do a little bit of a presentation or something like that at church. And after service, there was a bus waiting outside that would take the congregation, whoever wanted to, to the movie theater to see his movie and then bring them back to the church. Tell me that's not completely a way to work the system, to be independent, to have control of your own product, to know who your audience is, to be a visionary, and to keep making movies. <laughs> so I'm sure as soon as like next year, the Tyler Perry approach will not work anymore because that always seems like whatever works, you know, oh, it'll stop working next year. But this is more of what I recommend than the Kevin Smith approach that uh, I know a lot of filmmakers have been praying, wishing, and hoping, and putting all of their successful dreams on. Now, what I am gonna say, too, is that the Tyler Perry approach could really work. Yeah, you like this? <laughs> um, what I think is the main problem of why we only have 5% of female directors, why we have a gender gap report where we are only 22% of equality to the rest of the country is our media. Now, we are in an election year, so everybody gets freaking crazy on election year. They all start saying really weird stuff. And then like next year, we never even notice all the stuff is actually an issue. So uh, it's one of those things where I realize it's a little bit more timely. But we have binders full of women, y'all. <laughs> We have pregnancy resulting in rape is something that God intended. We have people 
who are actually the media that's actually calling it a war on women. This is more of a media campaign than an actual reality. Um, so the thing that we need to keep in mind yeah, is that the TV media is a business. They get money on advertising. And the more you watch, the more advertising dollars they get. So the news changes every day, right? So they got to keep you coming back. Things with a war on women, things with people saying something stupid and airing it over and over and over again. The whole scenario, if it bleeds, it leads. It's fear. It's I need to see what's going on in my neighborhood. I need to see what's going on in the world. And it perpetuates and perpetuates. So the scarier the story, not the more uplifting the story is what we're going to see in the media. Um, I'm going to give you an example. All right, my, uh, my husband was in uh, the United States Army. And uh, he signed up on 11, and he went into the Army because he, he knew it was the, the right thing to do. Um, he was sent over to Iraq, which, by the way, we did not understand. We were totally ready for a war in Afghanistan. We're like, yeah, all right, Afghanistan. Yeah, that's where we're going to go fight. What, Iraq? I'm sorry, what? What are we doing? <laughs> totally confusing to us, but regardless. Um, he was over there during the, you know, the beginning of the war and all that kind of good stuff. So I'm, I'm tuned to my television. Um, that is my connection to what is happening over there. I don't know if you guys remember the Jessica Lynch story. There was a maintenance company that was attacked. Um, my husband was in a maintenance company. Um, I got a phone call. Of course, I'm watching the news. But I get a phone call from my dad that says, you watching the news? And I'm like, yeah, yeah. And he's like, don't. Turn it off right now. Turn it off right now. And I'm like, well, fuck. <laughs> I'm turning it off. What the hell's going on? Um, the news did not know the number of the maintenance company. They did not know what battalion they were in. They knew nothing. All they knew was that it was a maintenance company, and they were showing the Al Jazeera live footage of people getting killed. I thought I was watching my husband on television dying. Um, from then, <laughs> wake up call, I realized that they don't understand that it's a family member, that these are real people. These numbers that they give out really do affect people's lives. They don't have respect for the people that they're selling their product to. I stopped watching the news. I watch Daily Show and Colbert Report. That's all I need. <laughs> That's all I need. I can keep up as best I can. But when you have that experience of, wait a second, th this is my family. This is not just some faraway country. It affects you quite differently. Um, so now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you that TV media is tame compared to advertising. All right? Advertising, an average American, I think I do have a slide. Let me see. Next. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> Americans are exposed to 247 ads every day. If you are awake for 24 hours straight, <laughs> you're going to see 10 ads every single hour. These are billboards, these are on television, these are in magazines, okay? That is a crap ton of ads that we're seeing. Most of the time we're seeing that more than the programs we watch. A half an hour program is actually only about 17 minutes. An hour long program is only 42 minutes. So you're actually watching a good bit of advertising on the programming, unless you watch PBS, I'm just, all right, sorry. <laughs> I do love my PBS because there is a lack of advertising. Um, so what I did is I searched, you know, Google's awesome. <laughs> Safe search was not necessarily on. So I searched advertisements that degrade women, right? Because that seems like the next possible way to go. So I'm going to show you <laughs> some of what I found. And some of these are older. It's nice to have a burn house. This was an ad actually from, I think it was the late 50s, early 60s. Um, blow in her face and she'll follow you anywhere. That one's from the 70s. <laughs> I did, I did make, make sure, sure these were actually real advertisements, too, make sure they weren't Photoshopped and all that kind of good stuff. Um, I remember this one as a kid. Does anybody else remember this one? Sarah, do you remember this one? No? Yeah, loves baby soft because innocence is sexier than you think. Is she Ted? I'm just saying. That was in teen magazines when I was growing up. Tiger Beat or, you know, what have you. Is obviously a dead hooker in the trunk. <laughs> I don't know what they're selling. I'm sure it's really awesome. What, are they selling them as <laughs> Totally. It's the shoes. Because, you know, either way, I'm totally going to buy something. Yeah. This one's great. This is um, an Italian ad. I'm assuming for purses. 
Um, very, very nice. Um, and so I'm looking at this site, and I'm like, all right, fine. This is the worst of the worst. These are older commercials as well. These were found, and I'm not, I'm not kidding you. You can totally go. It was on a website called itsguycode.com. After these images, and I'm only showing you the ones that I thought were real. Other ones really looked like they were Photoshopped or whatever, just for shock value. But he said this. I don't know if I'm going to be able to say it out loud without getting pissed. <laughs> But it said, I guess I'm supposed to say something about how unfairly the women are portrayed in these ads. I cannot do that because sex sells, and obviously these ads work. The only women who really get upset about these kind of ads are fat, ugly ones who never got enough attention growing up. In addition to lesbians, who fit the previously mentioned category, also find these ads repulsive. Oh well, there's always truth in jest, and even more truth in ads, and that's why they work. This is one website, this is one dude. <laughs> but hot damn, <laughs> I'm, I'm just, just saying. saying. So, so let's start looking, looking more realistically. realistically. And anybody, anybody tell, tell me if you guys have seen this one. one. Have you guys seen the manly calories? I, I, think, I think this one's fun. fun. I, I don't actually, I don't actually pull offense to this one for some reason, but it is a Dr. Pepper commercial. They come out like Rambo in the truck and they're off road and they're 23 flavors with all manly calories. It's not for women. All right, they're trying to be funny, they're trying to be jestful, but what they're actually doing is they're competing with vodka ads. Vodka ads <laughs> have gotten quite interesting um, and quite racy. Um, the O-Face, this was actually on the back of OK Magazine, the back cover. So like you pick it up, you know, when you're shopping, or when you're ready to check out, your kids are all like right there at that level. That was on the back. <laughs> Show us your O-face. <laughs> okay, all right, but that's vodka, right? It's an adult beverage. We're being playful, we're having fun with it. You guys know the Axe body spray, right? Axe body spray has always been um, out there. They've always been a little bit racy. So now Dial <laughs> has to compete with Axe body spray to turn a no into a definite maybe. It's soap for crying out loud, it's soap. Um, but Axe, this was on the back of Playboy. So sure, Playboy can get a little bit racier, but we're talking about, they have four different flavors, I don't know, scents, whatever you want to call them. It's Get Caliente with Fever. If you can't remember the night before, remember recovery. Wake up with the fuck up, shock. And this one, scrub away the skank with snake appeal. Just saying. So maybe taking it a little, little far? Maybe, just a little bit? Now, the actual worst, the, the worst competitors are actually high fashion. I mean, th th this is just the start of, you know what I mean, the start of the tip when it comes to what fashion will do for shock value. It started with the Chanel ad. The Chanel ad where it looks like he's punching a woman in the stomach. Um, so then Galt J. Nabana said, oh, no, 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 no. We're going to do you one better. We're going to show rape. <laughs> This is what I'm talking about. Somebody who's, you know, innocent, fun, all of a sudden it's a one-up, and it's a one-up, and it's a one-up, and, one and it doesn't seem to stop. So now, what I also start to look at, and what I see more, of course, in my everyday life, is I see somebody amazingly and strong, and I see somebody, this is Serena Williams. Serena Williams, when it comes to sports advertising, we see her as strong, we see her as beautiful, we see her as independent. She gets on the cover of magazines, and she's posing, and what is it? Serena heats up the summer with her butt out in the air. We've got a whole bunch of cleavage because she is serving up some serious sexy. And then we've got the ESPN. We've got an incredibly talented, powerful, verbal woman. And for ESPN magazine, we have her in the nude. So this is something where I don't understand how we even take our powerful women and bring them down not just. Um, let's see. So, we, oh, I might have my baby. Let's see, previous. Let's see. Okay. All right. And lastly, <laughs> um, these are the ones you're going to see the most often. Um, these are the ones that we probably see, I don't know, I'd say probably like 50 times a day. Um, if we're women, we probably actually see them close to 200 times a day. Um, I remember the first time my daughter related to the L'Oreal Paris, because you're worth it slogan, it was for eye cream. And I was really tired, and I, I struggle with sleep apnea, so I haven't been sleeping. So I had, you know, huge circles under my eyes, and it was for eye cream. 
My daughter watches that and says, Mom, you should totally get that eye cream because you're worth it. And I went hot damn. <laughs> so I'm ugly and I'm worth it to be beautiful. Wait a second, wait a second. Um, now, at first, I did totally love the Dove ad. Does anybody remember the Dove ad? They're still kind of doing it. They're still doing the real women. Um, so this was, they had a billboard in Times Square, and it was wonderful, and this was their new branding, that it was real women, real women used Dove. Do you know what they're selling in their advertisement? Stretch cream. Because big girls are beautiful, but they should remove their stretch marks. Kind of degrades the whole female empoweringness of Dove. <laughs> So that is what's up. So this is what I would say is actually the bigger problem with why we're not seeing that many female filmmakers. Because we are told from very, very young on television through advertisements that we're not pretty and we need to buy stuff. Um, that we need to be submissive in photos. Um, that even if we are wonderfully empowered and tremendously strong, we still need to be sexy for the guy. And then we see, of course, in small doses and mostly late at night, um, sexist and misogynistic advertisements and, uh, and films about women. So it's very hard to be like, I'm totally worth it. I'm totally going to kick butt, y'all. I'm, you know, I'm going to change these numbers. It's going to go from 5% to 30% next year because everybody's going to want to see my movie. I don't think because of the media, we're necessarily ready for it yet. I think once the media starts to change and show strong women and empowered women, we will start to change. Um, that's why I have my little Wonder Woman baby, by the way. <laughs> um, let me see. Now, things are actually changing, which is absolutely wonderful. Um, and human beings always move toward change. We always do. We have always worked to be more equal and more of a community. We fight against intolerance. So we are moving towards change. Um, I was privileged enough to be at the Heartland Film Festival last week. The Heartland Film Festival showed 31% of their movies were directed by women. Now, a lot of these numbers aren't necessarily going to show up in our 5% little graphic because they may only go on TV, they may only go on the internet, they may not get distribution. But what I'm seeing is that we're trying. And there's a lot of us that are really trying, and we're trying the good vote or the good fight to get out there. So women have unique voices and unique points of view because we just experience the world differently. Not better, not worse, just differently. And to be able to see a movie with a unique voice and a unique point of view, I think is something that we've been missing for a very, very long time. A different kind of cinema could evolve. <clears throat> I do ask you to support female filmmakers. And the best way to support them, honestly, is money, because we want them to make another movie. Every movie that you buy, every movie that you download is actually a vote. It's saying, this art has matter. I am putting my cash down to show that it has value. And you are giving that filmmaker, hopefully, another chance to invest in another movie, to believe in themselves that there is a chance that they can make a living at this. Because most are working nine to five and doing this part time because it is extremely hard to actually make a living in independent filmmaking, let me tell you. Um, they have, women have more reason now um, because of these terrible numbers that are out there to give up on filmmaking. So by emailing them, by messaging them, by supporting them, you're probably helping somebody who every day thinks that, you know what? I should just give up. The odds are totally stacked against me. So <clears throat> I'm going to end with this quote, OK? Um, I, sometimes I like ending with a quote. Sometimes I don't. But I, I saw this one, and I just I absolutely loved it. So in closing, this is a quote by Reed Williamson. And it's, our deepest fears is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our dark, that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, or fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? You are a child of the universe. You playing small does not serve this world. There is nothing enlightening about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure about you. We are all meant to shine as children do, and we were born to manifest that glory of creation that is with all of us. And in, it's not just in some of us, it's in all of us. <laughs> but I hope you enjoyed it. I took a little longer than I probably should have. <laughs>